From AIT Studios in Abuja, Nigeria, this is the O&M Late Show with Obiora Hilo and Mamode Akuga. Hello there. Good evening and welcome to your show, the O&M Late Show. Well, as you can see, we are in a celebration mood. Uh, the independence is around the corner, just two days away. Um, so much to celebrate. Some people say not so many things to celebrate. I don't agree. I don't agree at all. There is so much to celebrate after 55 years. Uh, maybe we've not gotten to where we wanted to be, but we've made quite some modest progress. So I say congratulations to you, Nigeria. And to you watching the show tonight, I say congratulations. Tonight, we'll be talking about Nigeria. Nigeria past, present, and future. But before we do that, um, this is an evening when so much is happening. Of course, if um, you were an ardent follower of the new rock star, Pope Francis, you would have discovered that he had a very successful trip that ended just a few days back in the United States. And about that same time, heads of government, heads of state, and um, prime ministers and top government officials were converging in New York for the UN General Assembly. Well, today, for the first time in 16 years, our president was among those that addressed the United Nations on his first day. Also today, uh, the president of the United States also addressed the uh, General Assembly. And of course, um, the president of Russia also addressed uh, the General Assembly. Our president raised the hope of uh, finding the Chibok girls in his speech at the United Nations. He also challenged world leaders to return Nigeria's stolen wealth hidden in their countries. And he put so many of our domestic challenges on the, in the international arena. Also today, um, President Putin of Russia also talked about what he said was the in quotes, the arrogance of some members of the United Nations that only said that what they propagated was the best for the world. And he talked about supporting governments that uh, are getting back you know, to, to, to their feet, like governments in Iraq. He talked about supporting and instituting proper governments in places like Libya. And of course, he talked about the need to support a legitimate government in Syria. Of course, those were things that uh, uh, the United States didn't quite believe in, and they also fired back. Well, let's leave all that in the international arena and come back home. Of course, you know that uh, today in the National Assembly, uh, our legislators were back to work, but in the Senate, uh, before they you know, embarked on our work, 83 senators endorsed the Senate president, the embattled Senate president. Uh, they said they, they, they have faith in him, they trust him, they believe in him. That was what they call a vote of confidence. Well, a few senators did not quite agree. One senator said, oh, my name should be struck out. I was not part of what happened. A couple of people raised issues, but at the end of the day, 83 senators uh, voted endorsing and reposing their confidence in the Senate president. Some Nigerians are saying, is that what should occupy our minds now? Um, the matter is still in court. Um, why are the senators, uh, you know, exhibiting this support at this time? Why don't they allow the, you know, the matter to come out of the courts or from the uh, the Code of Conduct Bureau before they can do all that. But maybe that's the best way to give support to the Senate President, and it was a big day for him today. 
Unfortunate news, Gamaliel on also day, technocrat, administrator, boardroom giant, is dead. He died at the age of 82. Of course, you remember he was born in 1933, played a whole lot of roles in many boardrooms in Nigeria. Well, he's fought a gallant fight and he's gone. I will remember him today and um, we reach out to his family and friends on a day like this. We condole with them. But I think we are strengthened by the fact that he lived a good life. I mean, so many successes. And he's a man that has left uh, his footprints in the sands of time. And of course, we also reach out to a lot of our brothers and sisters who lost their lives in Saudi Arabia, in MENA, during that stampede. You know, every day we get to hear uh, names of our countrymen that, you know, lost their life in that unfortunate incident. A lot of people say the Saudi authorities should get their act together. A lot of people say the Saudi authorities, you know, that they were negligent in allowing that to happen, especially when this was not the first time. We hope that in the years to come, that they have to get their act together and save many countries this heartache that we go through almost once every year. Well, those are some of the things that are trending around the country and around the world. And you're welcome to this special independence edition of our show, the O and M Late Show. Mamode is not here tonight, uh, but um, we have enough to keep you busy. If you look around our studio, you see we are in celebration mood. The studio is decorated in the colors of uh, Nigeria. Tonight, like I said, we are looking at Nigeria past, present, and future. And tonight, I have two great Nigerians. Tonight, they are joining me on the show, not as members of any political parties, but they are joining me as great sons of Nigeria. And objectively tonight, they'll be looking at where we have been, where we are today, and where we are going. And if our cameras are doing what they should be doing, I'm sure they'll be catching them now. I have former governor of Enugu State, former chairman of PDP, um, Dr. Okwesileze Ngodo. He's right in our studio, and he will be joining me in a moment to talk about Nigeria, past, present, and future. And just by his side, I also have someone who, uh, who has also seen it all uh, at the point who was the Deputy Senate President, Senator Ibrahim Mantu, CFR, former Deputy President of the Senate of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Both of them are joining me tonight to talk about Nigeria. They'll look at what it was like. Uh, I think both of them were around when we had our independence. So they will tell us about it and look at the challenges we've had, the successes we've had, and how we can move forward as a country. Tonight is a bumper package, but let me take you back to 1960, when we were just getting ready for our independence. Lagos, capital of Nigeria, prepares to give the welcome of its life to Queen Elizabeth II or, in its own language, to Oba Obiarin, the King Lady. A million Nigerians are here to greet her, among them the Federal Minister of Labor and Welfare, Chief Festus Okote Ibo. Seventeen hours from the mists of London Airport, the Queen's Argonaut comes to rest in the sunshine of Ikeja, the airport of Lagos. The Guard of Honor is mounted by the Nigeria Regiment, many of whom, like the Queen's husband, wear the Burma Star. General Sir James Robertson and Lady Robertson welcome the royal couple as they leave the Argonaut. In a temperature around 100 mark, the Queen still looks cool as the royal car makes its 13-mile journey to the capital at a steady 8 miles an hour. Every foot of the way, the road is packed with Nigerians. 
The welcome is as tremendous as any Her Majesty has ever been given. And it's a proud welcome. For this is no longer a people in colonial subjection, but a free nation with its feet already firmly on the road to self-government. The Queen's car draws up to the city boundary, where the leaders of Lagos are ready to greet her. The Governor-General is there to present them to Her Majesty. Chief Adonigi Adeli II, who has five wives and 25 children, is the first to welcome the royal guests to the city his ancestors have ruled for two and a half centuries. Next are legal and other dignitaries. A young lady who knows exactly where she's going and means to get there. When the Queen visits the Nigerian Federal House of Representatives, it is in the full panoply of monarchy. A rich contrast to the simple summer dresses she has worn for the less formal functions. She receives a loyal address and replies. Among her audience is Chief Festus Abo, Minister of Labour. Great hopes are centred on this new Nigerian leadership. Nigeria, a country as big as Pakistan, is rapidly becoming self-governing. Many expect it to become the foremost Negro state of the continent. In the grounds of Government House, a garden party is given for the royal visitors by the Governor-General Sir James Robertson and Lady Robertson. About half the 1,500 guests are Africans. Oba Adenigi Adeli II introduces some of Nigeria's area chiefs to a growing country where tradition and innovation go hand in hand. Glad to know you're still out there with us. And once again, I say happy independence. Uh, we're already in uh, celebration mood. And tonight we are looking at Nigeria past, present, and future. And that little clip that we played now, you know, brought a lot of memories. Um, memories of the things I read as a little boy in primary school, in secondary school, about how great our country was. But tonight, I have people that were there already here when all that happened. I'm being joined now by Dr. Kwesile Zemwodo, former governor of Enugu State and former chairman of the PDP, and Senator Ibrahim Mantu, CFR, former deputy president of the Senate of the Federal Republic. You're welcome, Your Excellency. My pleasure. <laughs> My pleasure. Good to have Good you evening. on a Thank special you. day like this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> I'm sure, like I did, you watched that little clip. Um, and if I was, if I listened, I listened very well. I heard what the narrator was saying about the hopes of Nigeria's greatness, what Nigeria was going to become. But before we talk about that, I don't know how old it, it, each one of you, how old you were in 1960, and what you remember. Let me start with you. Uh, Dr. Okwesile Zemwodo, what do you remember, you know, from 1960 and the, you know, the build up to independence? Well, I was 10 years in 1960, but old enough to feel the excitement of Nigeria becoming independent. In the build up to this independence, we had great Nigerian personalities like Dr. Namde Azikiwe like Dr. Michael Okpara from the East, and in the North we had the Sadwana of Sokoto, and Tafa Balawa, and in the West we had Obafemi Awolo. These people built up the consciousness of our country to a frenzy that we were all so excited to become independent. We had had so much of what it meant not to be independent, 
slavery, and new colonization and colonization and new colonization. We had had all of that. What our people went through over the years uh, that were under colonial rule. And to have our own people preside over our affairs, it was freedom. The smell of freedom was so exciting. We, as little children, we participated so actively in the build up to the celebration, practicing uh, marches, how we are going to march on Independence Day, and how we are going to fly the Nigerian flag, and so on and so forth. And of course, in our little uh, groups, uh, masquerades and dance groups that we were going to use to celebrate independence. That was the excitement at that time. It was like a new door was going to open, a new horizon in which nothing was envisaged could go wrong other than freedom, prosperity, and a country that will become the pride of the black nation all over the world. Okay, um, Senator Mantu, what are your memories? Did those uh, clips bring back some kind of nostalgia? Well, certainly yes, because uh, I was actually much older than uh, my friend here. I was 13 years old and, and primary six. And incidentally, uh, they selected people from the primary schools to uh, attend the ceremony in Jaws. And so they just put a yes and no. And I was lucky to pick the yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I was one of those people who actually witnessed the celebrations in the, in the provincial headquarters at that time. To be honest with you, it has been really, really mind-blowing looking back and seeing where we are today. I remember in those days, particularly the speech of the Prime Minister then, the man with the golden voice. I mean, when I heard him speak, if you lock him up in a, in, in a room and you are outside, you would think it's a white, it's an English person uh, mm -hmm. speaking because they spoke English, what they call Queen's English then. And they spoke with all the intonation that you need to uh, hear them talk. Uh, well, if you look at today, you know, the quality of education, uh, those people are not, most of them are not graduates, but <coughs> uh, we are performing better than even some professors today in terms of uh, the, the diction and even the sense in what they were saying. It was it's, it's something unique. One could see clearly that Nigeria was actually destined for greatness from the quality of leadership that we had in those days and the way the Africa looked up to them for our guidance and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, over the years, that hope and that dream was dashed to some extent but not total. Okay, everybody talks about the quality of leadership at that time. Mm. And I wasn't around in 1960, mm. but I've been opportuned to look back at what 1960 was like, the years after 1960, and what it is today. Let's look at our leaders. I've seen pictures of Tafawa Balewa, for instance, a particular picture that I enjoy so much, you know, looking at every time. When he was on leave as Prime Minister of Nigeria, and he was in his village in a small house with his folks and all that. And when he died, I didn't see mansions. Um, I remember my, my, uh, Michael Okbara. Yeah. I remember when he was coming back after years in, uh, exile. in exile, and he didn't have a house. And all the elites in Igbo land were putting heads together how to build a house for uh, Michael Okbara. Mm. I remember um, uh, Akan Ubiem, who, who was governor, and even Ahmadu Bello. I can't remember where anyone said this is his mansion mm -hmm. and all that, or his private jet. <laughs> Tell me. You know, um, you were not leaders in, in, in 1960, but you have grown to become leaders associated with some of these past leaders. What is unique about those leaders? Or what was unique about them? Well, I think if you ask me what was unique is in leadership, you need to have a vision 
and a mission. Those leaders were imbued with patriotism. What was underlining their leadership was freedom. They wanted to give us freedom from uh, 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 white rule. Their, their agenda was not self-aggrandizement. And because they were preaching and doing what they were preaching, people believed them. And they, 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 they sold a message which caught up with the people. And they were striving every day to deliver that message. Now, in, our, in the present circumstances in our country, we're not even allowed to meet the electorate and to deliver a message. We don't have, we, we ourselves don't have a vision. We don't have a mission. We're installed by Godfathers. And while in office, the agenda is to make sure that the Godfather is well nourished. Because we never went to the electorate to ask for a mandate. You never promised the electorate anything. You never believed in anything. When I was national chairman, I said that many of the people who were flying the flag of PDP had not read the constitution of the party. They had not read the manifesto. You are going to have a covenant with the Nigerian people, and you have not read the covenant. You just want a title for self-gratification and aggrandizement. You want to be a governor. You want to be a senator. You want to be a house of rep. The platform that you are climbing on its back to be that, what is the vision of that platform? What is the message of that platform? OK, we'll, 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 we'll get to that. Um, let me, let me com come back to you, uh, Senator. What do we need? to learn from those leaders, Awolo, Namde Azikiwe, um, Balawa, uh, Aminu Kano. Well, first of all, let me tell you this. First of all, those leaders saw leadership as a unique opportunity to serve humanity. They saw it as a responsibility bestowed upon them by the people and they actually tried to discharge those responsibilities with the fear of God. They were selfless in the discharge of their uh, duties. They didn't see occupying a public office as an opportunity or the quickest means of becoming rich as it is today. Today, somebody who makes money either through cocaine pushing or any other uh, bad means, he will come and then buy the delegates and he will win an election and become a governor. He spends 10 million and he wants to go back with 10 billion after the end of four years. That's what it is today. So you don't, even people don't even ask where is your background, but in those days, nobody will actually make you to represent them until they see what, how you have been identifying with the community from the beginning. What have you contributed to development in the community? And so in those days, the people will look at you and say, look, this man has actually done so much for the community and we should give them the opportunity to represent it at a higher level because they have watched you, how you, are, how you are growing. Your contributions to the community is being noted and appreciated. You didn't buy anybody. Nobody said, in fact, in most cases, those leaders were actually approached. They didn't go to conversing for positions. No. People came to them and said, look, do this. I remember Chief Solomon Lara, I remember he was a teacher. He was teaching in the <laughs> classroom, which is short nika, you know, in those days. And people came and said, look, you should go and represent us in Lagos. He was, no, I want to prefer to be a headmaster here. They said, no, no, no. So, and even in myself, in 1979, when I contested the election, it was the people who, con who, who came to, seven times they were coming to bring me, I said, no. They had to bring my father to come and tell me, if I don't agree, he was, was going to cast me. And that was how I joined politics. I didn't join politics because I wanted to be in politics. I was dragged into it by the, by the, com by the community. Th that was the, the, the situation then. But today, it is you who, somebody will come to me and say, Senator Mantua, I say yes. I have come to you because I want to uh, join politics. The next thing will tell you, I want to be the governor of Plateau State next year. 
and he is coming to politics for the first time. Nobody has seen him perform, do anything for the party. He is coming day from day one, and he wants to take the number one position. No tutelage? Uh, no, s s at all. And that is why democracy has been destroyed completely today. Okay. Um, Dr. Modo, your father was a regional minister. In other words, you saw how it was done. I will ask again, what was peculiar about their style? Because your father was there with, with, the, with his contemporaries. Just like uh, Senator Mantu said, at that time, your pedigree was important. You are being identified as a community leader was important. The votes counted. Exactly. Now, there was a level playing ground. Everybody who wanted to serve had unfettered opportunity to tell the people what he wanted to do for them. Mm -hmm. And the people were not hindered in casting their votes. Now, you'll find out that in those days, when results are declared, they said somebody had a landslide, somebody lost deposits. Yes. <laughs> and that was the that was a test of the community endorsement mm. of the leadership. And your party valued you depending on the number of votes you garner during election. It showed where you are standing in the society. And they respect you and they give you all the privileges that they need to nurture your remaining in the party and harnessing these votes when the elections come. Okay. Where did we go wrong? What went bad? What didn't we do? Or what are we not doing? When we return, I'll be asking those questions. But first, let's go to the streets and see what Nigerians think about Nigeria at 55. As a people, and that was the greatest achievement. I remembered since when I was in secondary school, I used to know a lot of people saying that if their region is not given what they want, Nigeria will disintegrate. So to me, the greatest achievement is for Nigeria to be one throughout these years, and also our democracy since 1999 till date. I'm very much proud of Nigeria's achievement, considering the fact that right from independence up to now, we are still one nation, one country. We've tried all the best we could to see that Nigeria remains a united nation, and that is what we are having today. Definitely, I'm proud of the achievement of this nation, because for 65 years, we've been able to evolve as an emerging democracy in African nation. I know we've had our bad points as a nation, passing through a civil war that lasted for three years. We haven't done, haven't passed through a civil war like many other nations that have, and we've been able to grow this fast with an ethnic diversity. Diversity. I believe that Nigeria is a nation that every nation should admire. The last democratic process that led to this new government is something no African nation nation have achieved. Nigeria is a growing nation. If you look at the, the economic index, you discover that Nigerian adjunct of Africa, given 150, uh, 170 million people in Nigeria, Nigeria is doing well. Nigeria is doing well. The only area we have some difficulties is, uh, is in the power sector. So once we are able to tackle the power sector, microfinance, I mean micro uh, economy system will boost up. Of course, we have achieved a lot of things in the area of uh, electricity. There's a lot of improvement on it. And then we're still waiting for so many things like employment. A lot of Proud of our achievements so far because of this democracy that came on. Uh, like before the democracy, there, was, there wasn't much development. Unlike now, there are so many developments. The sector is being improved, fight for, uh, fighting corruption and other things. So I'm proud of the achievement. Well, if we're going to, you know, appraise what they said by percentage, 
they think Nigeria has not done so badly. So where did Nigeria go wrong? For a country uh, that so many across the world believe so much in and looked forward to its greatness, what went wrong? And I still have uh, Dr. Kwesile Zongodo, <laughs> uh, former governor of Enugu State, uh, former chairman of the PDP. I also have uh, Ibrahim Mantu, a former Senate president, uh, a deputy Senate president uh, <laughs> of the Federal Republic. And, you know, every Nigerian is wondering where we got it wrong, you know. I remember that in 1960, where you came from was not an issue. At what point did we lose all that, the Nigerianness in us? And then tribalism came in and corruption took center stage. At what point? What actually went wrong? Well, I think the, the Nigeria started to derail when the military took over power in Nigeria. Exactly. It was Dr. Namde Ezekiel that said that the, um, the uh, worst democratic government is better than the best military government that you can ever have. The mere fact that people could not collectively express their wishes about the way forward. And then the entire legislative arm of government was subsumed in a few members of the Armed Forces Ruling Council. Dictatorship took over. Besides, Barak's mentality took over. And these issues have shaped Nigeria at a very critical time of its development. Just as we were beginning to build democracy in our country, we were derailed by military intervention. And after the military intervention, when politics came back, we had people joining politics who had absolutely no idea what politics and democracy meant. And there was no organized system to key them in into what was expected of them. Now, they came in inheriting military mentality into the democracy. And you, you find civilian governments talking with immediate effects. In democracy, there's nothing like immediate effect. It has to, things have to pass through a democratic system and be cooked through the meal of both the legislature and the executive before implementation. If you have a budget, the executive draws the budget, it subjects it to debate in the parliament. And the people now make their input before the, 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 it, it becomes law for execution. So this, we, we, we just abandoned the system and if you look at other countries that didn't go through this and just continue to develop their democracy, the, the, what you have in Nigeria is totally different from what happens in such places. Senator Mantu, did, did corruption come with the military? Because even before the military came, some political leaders were being accused of corruption, bribery and all that. Well, uh, as, you, as you said in your opening remarks, our leaders there, the First Republic leaders, were people who, after their death, we didn't identify mansions, uh, choice cars, and the rest of them, or fat bank accounts that they left behind. So if they were truly corrupt, as they were accused by the first coup plotters, we could have found houses belonging to them, we could have found fat bank accounts both inside and outside Nigeria belonging to these people. But mo almost all of them did not have anything to write home about. They lived in ordinary houses. The Sardona, when we were young, we used to think he was the richest man in the world. 
because of his generosity. He would come, you know, politicians are from buoyant and uh, they try to be so generous. He will come with all these uh, uh, gowns, cheap, cheap gowns, we were kids then, you know, and he will give so many people gowns to wear, you know, uh, Babadi and the rest of them. I will say, hey, this man is the richest man in the world. But when he died, there was only 56 pounds in his bank account. 56 pounds in his bank account, nothing more anywhere. anywhere. Can you imagine? So, it is then the, 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 the military that actually stayed the coup. I think if they were here today, I would have said they would have apologized, they would have apologized to our leaders even in their graves. Because they were accused of corruption, they were accused of all sorts of things. But today, they are saints. If they would come back to life and see what is happening, the magnitude of, of the, the, the dimension that corruption was taken, they will willingly rush back to, from where they are coming from because they won't believe it. They won't believe it. Uh, corruption has taken, has become endemic in our life. And people, uh, our own corruption now is not even just corruption, but we are greedily corrupt. There's element of greed in our corruption. Recently, a woman, they found 3.5 billion naira in her house when they were doing this pension something. A woman, <laughs> not even a man. <laughs> so, can you imagine the dimension which, which corruption has taken? So, I think like uh, my colleague here has said, the first disaster that actually affected our destined journey, I mean, to our journey to, destin to our destined greatness, the first disaster that took place is the military intervention. Like you said earlier, people, Igbos, we are here in my village, for example, we look at them as the white people because we are learning from them. They, they are the ones who are bringing civilization. And they were part and parcel of the society and the community. They partook in everything. There was no discrimination at all against anybody. But when the military had the first coup, and it was suspected to have been selective in killing those, they, then there was a counter coup. Then that, didn't that now laid the foundation for all this suspicion and tribalism, the rest of them. And it continued like that and like that and like that until indeed the military now changed the face of everything. Okay. Because, you see, they did not tolerate the mistakes of our past leaders. If they had tolerated the mistakes of, of, of our past leaders, we could have learned through trial and error. And indeed, things would have actually uh, gone the way it has gone in other developed and advanced nations. But before I say so, I, don't, I want the military to appreciate, I appreciate the present military crop that have decided to allow politicians to play politics and they to play their own military work. Because since 1999 to date, this is the first time in the history of Nigeria that democracy has been allowed to last this long. And that's why a lot has happened, but I will come to that later. I don't want to. Okay. Um, I was... You know, as part of, uh, you know, uh, getting information and knowledge uh, for this program, I stumbled on a document that was commissioned by the, an agency of the United Nations in 1955. It was a document that was looking at Nigeria's development, you know, it was going to go from 1955 till about 1965. And, you know, in that document, at every point of the document, what the, the consultants and all that were saying was that there was so much resources to address the problems of Nigeria. Mm. Some of the issues they, they raised were uh, manpower, you know, quality manpower, mm. uh, local manpower, mm. and then uh, finding places where the money could be well spent. Mm which means that we, there was so much. And then after independence, we, we, we still remember the granite pyramids, mm -hmm. uh, the palm, palm plantations, cocoa. cocoa, rubber, name it. Are we going to blame the military too for abandoning the agro-based you know, economy that we had that was doing so well? Yes. Where do we you know, place that blame for from a country, rich country, to a poor country? Well, 
if I may come in, they, we, we should place that blame purely on the discovery of oil. Because rather than oil being an additional wealth, we now abandon other sources of revenue and then concentrate on oil because like, oil is like food is ready. So you come, nobody wants to go and do anything that will actually uh, uh, take time before it, 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 it matures. The military abandoned agriculture because they were getting easy money from oil. And gradually, it was our rural people were now, you know, living agriculture and taking up other uh, 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 means of uh, livelihood, you know. And agriculture, in fact, we need to stumble into another document which says that the present Bielsa state and it, it was a Chinese company that did a research in 1956. And they said that the present Bielsa state would, could produce rice for the whole of Nigeria and even export to other parts of Africa. You know, rice production, Chinese company. The Chinese people did that research, I have it. So you can see clearly that uh, like Thailand now, we've been importing rice from Thailand. Nigeria would have been actually exporting rice like Thailand. And like you said rightly, everything that we were this prosperity we're talking about was all from agricultural produce. Yes. Nothing to do with this. Not to talk about the abundant, solid, natural resources that we have underground, which was not touched. In fact, nobody has ever bothered to even touch nat uh, solid natural resources until Abacha came into power with, this, uh, with due respect to him. Abacha was the first head of state that established Ministry for Solid Minerals. And solid minerals are about everywhere in Nigeria. There's no state in this country that hasn't got one type of solid mineral or the other. Indeed, experts are saying, if we are to explore our solid minerals, what we will get from it, we will just make oil as just, you know, peanut completely. So I think again, here again, we will lay the blame on the military because they have been so long in power and they have abandoned that area. And now I hope that with the restoration of uh, democracy, which has started taking long, longer than necessary, we'll no, lo, 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 long, long enough to stay, we must. Because we cannot continue to blame the military forever. And now that they have given us space to actualize our dreams, we must go back to base. We must go back to see what kind of things can we do so that we, our, because God did not want anything called poverty to happen to Nigeria. Okay. Nigeria has no piece of poverty. God uh, made it from the beginning that this country will be very, very rich and it will have quality human resources. So the combination of abundant natural resources and qualitative human resources should make any country flow with milk and honey. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Modo, you were governor. Um, and I'm sure that position, you know, made a whole lot you know, available to you. So you would have seen what happened several years, what your predecessors did and all that. So why did we have that consistent abandonment of agriculture, which for, from all intents and purposes was our best uh, uh, passport to, to wealth as a nation? Well, just like uh, Senator Mantis said, the most important thing about leadership is having vision. If you have leaders that have no vision, no matter the resources available to them, nothing will happen. But you're one of the, the new leaders. Yes, I'm going to tell you. Now, when we had this oil wealth, and we abandoned our natural wealth, which would have used the oil wealth to oil, yes. then we got into trouble. When I, I was governor in Enugu, my, uh, my hero was Dr. Emma Yokbara. Because I love agriculture. Even though I'm a medical doctor, I just love agriculture. And because of what he had achieved in agriculture in eastern Nigeria, I made agriculture my number one program. Indeed, the document which I put consultants together to forge for agricultural development in Enugu State was Christian creating a new world base through agriculture. 
70% of Enugu people who are working are working in the farms as peasant farmers. And if we can modernize the agriculture, we are putting money into 70% of the population. And why not? We had arable land. All we needed was government intervention to move from subsistence farming to modern agriculture. So what happened to that plan? This document, we put it together, and it's on record that when we presented it to the World Bank, World Bank said they had never seen a document of this nature from any third world country at that time. President Babangida had said that they were not going to guarantee any more foreign loans for states. But because of what the World Bank said about our document, he promised to guarantee us to raise the loan from the World Bank to implement that program. When Abacha made his coup, no government in Enugu state has ever dusted that document <laughs> from the shelf in the governor's office. So the military again. We'll take another short break. When we come back, I'll be asking these very prominent Nigerians, how do we fix our country? Don't go away. Well, Senator Mantu, if, um, if uh, Zeke, who said that, that one of his greatest achievements was uh, see Nigeria become independent and all that, if he were to come back today, from what you said, he would be so disappointed. So uh, we don't have too much time, but how can we go about fixing our nation? Well, I believe that um, we should be able to learn from the past because we've made mistakes. But uh, if you look at the history of the world, even those so-called developed nations, that at one time or the other, they were at our own stage. But we have an advantage of learning faster than them because we can see what is happening around us. Uh, I've always said that we, politicians and leaders, should be born again. We should apologize to Nigerians for mismanaging the nation and promise and, and be repentant and promise never again to do it, to, 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 to continue in the same way. Because every politician should see the responsibility of giving, being given a mandate to, uh, uh, to, 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 to govern the people as a special responsibility that he is going to give account of to the people here and even hereafter. Because when you trust me, 
to be your eyes, to be your ears, to be your mouth, to think for you and do everything on your behalf. That is a heavy responsibility. Unless we come to terms with the oath we take, when we are given responsibility, we take oath of office. But we are just blabbing. We are not aware or conscious of the serious responsibility we are taking between us and our Creator God in heaven and the people that give us that mandate. So uh, Nigerian leaders must be born again. We must learn from our mistakes of the past and then see the responsibility of running a nation as a serious responsibility. And if you are not going to do it in the interest of the people, don't accept to run for a public office. Okay, um, Dr. Mwodo, um, we have a new crop of leaders today. We have a new government. Um, we have new people in the National Assembly. We have new people in states and all that. In fixing our nation, what would be your advice? Well, I think that um, Nigeria can't go on like this. We can't go on like this. And um, one of the biggest problems we have in this country is that we have no way of correcting people who have gone wrong. We have laws, but Nigeria, in Nigeria, laws are disobeyed with impunity. Yes, sir. And you, there's no way everybody will get away with impunity and then we are progressing to greatness. It, it doesn't work out that way. So I, I, I completely support the new government in the war against corruption. But in supporting this government in their war against corruption, <laughs> General Buhari tried this before. And he jailed people for over 100 years. And those people came back, they became senators, they became governors, they became ministers. The one must be prosecuted in such a way that if you are found guilty, the deterrent is that you can never, for the rest of your life, be allowed to assume public office. You know, we, 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 have, to, we have to make these laws and we have to implement them, we have to obey them. If there is no deterrent, Nigerians will never, never change. They will never change. So that is one. And I don't, I'm not even subscribing to the government bogging itself down only with war of, on corruption. Attitudinal change. And discipline. Let us think about Nigeria tomorrow. Everything must not happen today. We have to start civic education from the kindergarten, mm. primary. We are what we are, some of us today, because of the way we are brought up. To have respect, to have integrity, to, to, to you know, have a clear, a clear in our mind what is right and what is wrong. The p children we are bringing up now have no conscience. They so don't go to church. We have, we have they don't to go, go to mosque. We have to go back to the basics. We have to go to civics. These children have to be brought up. Let us think about tomorrow. Let us bring our children up for tomorrow. If I may the people add. today, mm. let us punish those the guilty. who are guilty <laughs> yeah. and let there be deterrent for we adults. As just right, one, just <laughs> one, one <laughs> sentence. As, as a writer to what he's saying, <laughs> I think that this is the time for us to have special courts to try corruption, because people are using hiding under technicalities. Cases since 1999, they have been on. Nobody has finished these cases. So there is a there need. There must be a special court. Unless there is a special court that will decisively deal with this situation without wasting time. Otherwise, people will continue to use technicalities, and then they will, for 100 years, and the case is not Thank finished. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Thanks for coming <laughs> Thanks on, on the show. Um, Thanks, Obi. Right. Right. So, this is your first time. So yes. You go oh, with oh this. and um, uh, <laughs> then. Thank you. Um, um, Senator Mantu has been here before. Yes. Today is a special day. Thank you very much. So this Happy is for you. New Nigeria. <laughs> 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 and that's our package for today. Um, Happy Independence. 
not just to celebrate it, but let's be born again, like Senator Mantu said, and then let's resolve to fix our country. I'm Obi Orilo from Abuja, Nigeria. Happy Independence, and let's do it again Friday night at 11 p.m.